we are taking a journey through an incredible subject, the Great Controversy. And this week, we are looking at lesson number three, Light Shines in the Darkness, a very important bit of history for Christianity. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for blessing us with an opportunity to study this incredible theme. And as we look at this subject this week, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to a significant element of the history of Christianity that can give us hope for today and tomorrow. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we take a look at this week's lesson, we will have with us once again the author of this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Pastor Mark Finley. He is an international speaker, evangelist, author. Pastor Mark, we're glad to have you back again. Thank you, Eric. It's always great to work with my friends at It Is Written Television. Well, this week, as I mentioned, we're taking a look at Light Shines in the Darkness. And this week's memory verse is a significant one. I'd like to read it and then give you an opportunity to reflect a little bit on it. It is found in John 12, verse 35. It says, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. What's the significance of this text? Throughout the Bible, you have this contrast between light and darkness. Light reveals God's way, God's truth. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 8 said, I am the light of the world. So walking in the light is walking with Jesus. Walking in the darkness, Satan is the author of darkness. That is spiritual darkness. He wants people confused and not understanding the word of God. So when Jesus says, walk while you have the light, just before that, he talked about his crucifixion. And what he was saying is, I'm here now. I'm revealing truth to you now. Walk in the truth you have. The spiritual lesson of that to each of us is that at some time in every life, God reveals his light and truth, and he invites us to walk in it. In fact, not only some time, but every day, God is revealing to us facets of light and truth, and he's encouraging us to create an appetite, a desire, the will to do whatever he asks us to do and walk in the light of his word. So there is in this world, in this life, light and darkness, and there are many Bible verses that draw this out. I'd like to read a couple of more Bible verses here, Pastor Mark, John 14, 6 and John 8, verse 44, and give you the opportunity to compare and to contrast those two. I'll start with John 14 and verse number 6. In John 14, verse number 6, Jesus says, or Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then we're going to contrast that with John 8, verse 44, where Jesus says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So one of these verses is clearly describing Jesus and the other is clearly describing the adversary. Help us to draw some things out of these verses. Well, Jesus is the author of truth and all truth resides in Christ. And so Jesus reveals the truth of his word to lead us on the pathway of eternal life. Truth can only take one form. For example, if I say 1 plus 1 equals 2, or 3 plus 2 equals 5, or 5 times 6 equals 30, how many right answers are 5 times 6 equals 30? It's not 31, it's not 28, it's it's one right answer. So truth can take one form, error can take many. So here, uh, Satan is the father of lies. He will do everything he can to confuse the mind, to lie to us. There's another aspect of that too, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Christ reveals the truth to us, he reveals the truth about salvation the truth about his word, the truth about the fact that we are children of God, the truth about the fact that he's doing everything he can to save us. 
The devil reveals lies to us. He speaks lies. He says, you're unworthy. You cannot be saved. He says, your sins are too great. You cannot be saved. He says that uh, you have no self-worth or self-esteem. In Christ, we find the truth about Jesus, but we also find the truth about ourselves. We find the truth about the point of salvation. Satan wants to distort all that and confuse our thinking. Pastor Mark, when we talk about truth, um, years ago, I think many people accepted that there is a truth, there is one truth. Today, it's become more and more popular to believe that I have my truth and you have your truth, and, and we all have our own truths, and they don't necessarily have to agree, which if you stop and think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that doesn't stop it from being popular. In this lesson, you talk about the source of truth. What is the source of truth and why is it so important for us to understand that? You know, it's it's really kind of amusing to me, uh, Pastor Eric, when people say, oh, I have my truth, you have your truth. And uh, truth is relative. Well, would you say that to your employer? You have your truth. I'm supposed to be here at eight o'clock in the morning, but I got my truth. I want to sleep until 10. You know, I, I don't think the employer would accept that. There are certain principles. Um, what about the law of gravity? You know, I've got my truth and I'm going to step off the Grand Canyon because I think I'm going to go up. That's not truth. That's delusion. You know, the law of inertia. Bodies in motion remain in motion unless they're stopped by some outside force. That's why I can't drive down the highway uh, in the wrong lane and hit a trailer truck and think I'm going to survive, you see. So so there are objective truths in the area of anatomy and physiology. There are objective truths. You can say, I've got my truth, you've got your truth, you can smoke all you want. No, a high-fat diet predisposes me to heart disease. There are objective truths. So in the Word of God, we find in John 17, verse 17, Jesus saying to us, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. So truth is not a matter of my definition. Truth is not a matter of what I think. It's not a matter of what I guess. T biblical truth, the truth of morality, the truth of ethics is found in the word of God. And just like scientific truth, just like truth about anatomy and physiology, it's very objective, very clear. Truth is important for us to, to understand, to grasp, to accept if we want to function in this world in preparation for, for heaven. Uh, Paul kind of keeps this idea going. I'd like to read something that Paul writes uh, or describes Paul in Acts 20, verses 27 through 32. I'll take a moment to read that here. Acts 20, beginning in verse number 27 says, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What idea is, is he trying to get across here? Uh, and then I want to read another passage from 2 Thessalonians. Well, Paul, Pastor Eric, is... Uh meeting with the elders at Ephesus. He's at a place called Miletus. I visited that place, great preserved uh, ruins there. And so the elders know that Paul is going by ship. The ship is going to stop at Miletus. They hasten from Ephesus to meet him. He pours his soul out to them. He says in verse 27, I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. In other words, Paul says, I'm not resisting sharing with you the truths of God's word because I'm afraid you won't accept them. This is God's counsel. And by the Holy Spirit, as church leaders, share this counsel with the church. Then he says, take heed to yourselves. In other words, be careful, watch out, be on guard. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Then I know this, after my departing, savage wolves will come in. So there will be persecution from without. The early Christian church faced Roman persecution from without. Many 
were burned at the stake. Others were killed with the sword. Some were imprisoned and some even thrown to lions. Savage wolves. And Paul was saying it's only the counsel of the word of God, only the truth of God's word that can preserve you. But then he makes this amazing statement. Verse 30. Also among yourselves, men will rise up. From where? From where? Among yourselves. Right in the midst of the Christian church. They'll speak perverse or crooked things. Watch and remember. And then he says, verse 32, I commend you the word of God that's able to build you up, give you an inheritance among the sanctified. What Paul is actually saying is beware of two things. First, persecution from without. The persecution that comes from what he calls savage wolves that want to destroy you. But second, and even more deadly, there'll be those that rise among you within the Christian church that will teach error for truth. They'll bring in compromise. And Paul says, there's only one way to avoid that. I commend to you the word of God that can build you up. And Paul gives us this, this warning in several places, actually quite a few places. I'm thinking of 2 Thessalonians here, chapter 2. I'll read a few verses. Uh, this is chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. He says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It sounds here like truth is really important. It is incredibly important. There'll be a day when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. There'll be a day that church and state unite. There'll be a day that the Antichrist uh, reigns upon the throne of this world. But, Paul says, why are people deceived? Because they received not the love of the truth, so they believe a lie. So you can never know a lie. You can only know the truth, but you can believe a lie. And so Paul is saying is the truth of God's word. The scriptures are the safeguard against the lies of Satan in the last days. And that's really why we're studying this quarter's lesson is to be able to discern truth from error, understand the light and the darkness, the right and the wrong, uh, black and white, uh, and all the, all the mixture in between that sometimes we can get confused about. Pastor Mark, there is a, a supplement, a complement to this quarter's study guide. It is another book that is called The War Between Good and Evil. Tell us a little bit about that book and why we might want to pick that up. The War Between Good and Evil takes the themes that we have been studying each week in our Sabbath school lessons and expands upon them. We go into stories of Christian history, Christian martyrs who stood firm for Christ. We reveal their dedication and their commitment. We look at early Adventist history and talk about the faithfulness of early Adventist believers. But then the book, the last four or five chapters, focuses on end time, last day events, and really illuminates what's coming in the future. I know to be a great blessing to your viewers, Eric. So that book, once again, is called The War Between Good and Evil. The author is Pastor Mark Finley, and you can find that book very easily by going to itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop. We're going to be coming back in just a moment as we continue looking at light shining in the darkness so that we can understand the significance of this subject and prepare for the days ahead. We'll be right back. If you'd like to deepen your understanding of the powerful themes brought out in this program, we invite you to explore the book, The Great Controversy. For more information, simply text the code GC24 to 71392. This book delves into critical end time themes, offering profound insights into historical events, Bible prophecy, and spiritual preparation essential for today's unique challenges. Discover how The Great Controversy can illuminate your path 
in these uncertain times. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about studying the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious as well. Well, here's what you do if you want to dig deeper into God's Word. Go to itiswritten.study for the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will take you through the major teachings of the Bible. You'll be blessed, and it's something you'll want to tell others about as well. itiswritten.study. Go further. itiswritten.study. Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are looking at light shining in the darkness. And Pastor Mark, I'm going to read another couple of Bible verses here. And we've been looking at truth and error, right and wrong, light and darkness. And we see this theme over and over again. This is John 17, verses 15 through 17. In John 17, verse 15, Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Then in verse 17, he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And over in the book of Acts, chapter 20, in verse number 32, we find these words written. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So we read that verse just a little while ago, but we're comparing that over here to John 17. Uh, why, how does the word of God help us to not be deceived if we are willing to read it and understand it and believe it and put it into practice in our lives? The word of God reveals the truth of God for the people of God to prepare them for the coming of God or the coming of Jesus Christ. So the word is God's objective statement of reality. It's a roadmap from earth to heaven. And so when the Bible says, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. Notice the word sanctify. The word sanctified means set them apart. It means to cleanse them, make them holy. The word of God is the living word. When the seed of the word is planted in the soil of our minds, it transforms and changes our lives. God moves powerfully through his word. Jesus is exalted through the living word of God to reveal to us his truth. And as you mentioned, that truth is objective. It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, it remains the truth. And there's some significant consequences both ways if we believe it and walk in it or not. Pastor Mark, on Tuesday's lesson, there are a couple of paragraphs that I think are very powerful. The last two paragraphs on Tuesday's lesson. I'd like to give you an opportunity to, uh, to read those and to also uh, just elaborate on them a little bit and share why, those, why you think those are so important, why those words were, were penned by you and incorporated into this quarter's lesson. Sure. As, you know, as I was thinking about the truth of God's word, I was thinking about what would you know about Jesus if you didn't have the Bible? I mean, what would you know about the plan of salvation if you didn't have the Bible? So I wrote these words. Uh, this is Tuesday's lesson. After all, what would we know about the plan of salvation with the, uh, if we didn't have the Bible? How much, if anything, would we understand about the birth, life, teachings, and ministry of Jesus? Without the scriptures, would we even begin to comprehend the depth of Christ's sacrifice, the glory of his resurrection, the power of his intercession, and the majesty of his return? I mean, I think the answer to the question, uh, Pastor Eric, is obvious. If we did not have the Bible, we would be ignorant of the great plan of salvation. And then I go on to write, all these crucial truths are revealed, taught, and emphasized in the Word of God. It and it alone must be the final and ultimate standard for understanding all truth. Hence, we must fight against any and all attempts to undermine its authority or inspiration, even from those who, while professing great love of the Bible, bring doubts about it even subtly. Tragically, especially through the inroads of modern thinking, many theologians and Christians focus so much on the human side of Scripture 
that the Bible becomes the word of man rather than the word of God. And then the last paragraph, I take a little shot uh, at some of those who are criticizing the Bible. And I say, really now, if the Bible has no relevance, really now, if this were true, why should we be living today in the 21st century really care about what these people thought, that is the Bible writers, if they're just human writers, much less what they thought about the foundation of our hope for eternity. In other words, if the Bible is simply culturally shaped, now we do not deny that there are cultural influences in the Bible, but the inspiration of the Bible, God works through human agents to pen his divine word. Sure, they are product of their culture, but what God, what God reveals to them and how they write that down is the living word of God inspired by God. That's why 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we don't deny that these men were part of their culture. What we do say is that culture does not shape, does not overshadow, does not become superior to the revelation of God, which is divine truth. Over 3,000 times in the Bible, it says, God revealed truth. God said, God said, God revealed truth. So I can take the Bible in my hands and know that it is the living word of God. And in a world today where truth, as you mentioned, seems relative, uh, it's nice to know that we can hold on to something. On Wednesday's lesson, you tell a story about being lost in the woods. Share that story with us and why that's important to our discussion. Well, my wife and I were flying, I think it was to the Middle East, it was, and we stopped over in Switzerland. We had a night uh, because our plane was flew from the United States, got to Switzerland in mid it to late afternoon, and then we were to go the next day to fly to the Middle East. So it was... Sundown probably wasn't until 7.30, 8 o'clock, so we had some time. We were staying in a hotel not far from the mountains with some forests. And I said to my wife, look, this is amazing. We've stopped in Switzerland. Let's go hiking. So we begin to hike. And she said, are you sure you know the way? I said, no problem, dear. I know the way. Kept hiking further in the forest. Are you sure? You know what? To get back? Oh, yeah, we're just going to turn around in this trail. And then I took a right, and I took a left, and I took another right. I hated to admit it, Pastor. But I got so hopelessly lost in the forest that I didn't know where I was going. Not at all. The sun was setting. It was beginning to get semi-dark, you know, and I didn't know where I was going. We were hopelessly lost four or five miles from our destination, way, way out in the forest. And Oh, man. Not only was I embarrassed, I was concerned. But then I saw some people walking down the trail who knew where to go. And I said to them, hey, uh, we're staying in this hotel and, and we're kind of lost. They said, look, you're five miles from where you want to be. Look, we've got our car parked by the road out here. Um, if you come with us, we'll give you a ride back to your hotel. What did I need when I was lost? I needed a guide. I needed somebody who knew the way. So the Bible is God's guide. It reveals to us, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, 105. So God's word is the objective revelation of his will that provides a guide for us in these critical times of earth's history. Pastor Mark, as we're kind of getting ready to, to tie off this week's lesson, we're in a great controversy right now, and Satan has a primary focus in this battle. What is his primary focus and how can we guard against that? Satan's primary focus is deception. As we read in John 8, verse 44, he is a liar and the father of lies. The book of Revelation reveals a system of religion, a false system called Babylon. And it says Babylon is fallen. The word Babylon means confusion. So the devil's prime goal is to confuse us, to deceive us, to get us to think that the, the word of God is irrelevant in this generation, to lead us to, to our own human reasoning and human thinking. As it says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, everyone went his own way. As it says in Judges 5, that they did what was right in their own eyes. So the devil's goal is to get us to live lives separate from God 
and to trust our own human reasoning. As the Bible says, there's a way that seems right unto the man, Proverbs 14, 12, it ends in death. God's plan is to lead us to Jesus and to lead us to desire to do Jesus' will, to lead us to follow Jesus' word and by the power of the living Christ to walk in the way of truth and not in the way of error. So we want to go to God's word. We want to find truth there. How can we keep from misinterpreting it? Because there there are many interpretations of scripture out there. What's the safest way that we can keep heading in the right direction? We keep from misinterpreting truth by having an honest heart. Understanding truth is, is as much a matter of the heart as it is the mind. In fact, Jesus says in John 7, verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. So the desire is to know the will of God. As we get on our knees and play fair with God, we say, God, all I want to know is your will. Reveal it to me. So first we come with an honest heart, then we come with an informed mind. We come with an honest heart telling God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then we come with an informed mind asking God to direct us through his word. And Pastor Mark, if we do that, we can expect that he is indeed going to answer that prayer. I want to thank you once again, Pastor Mark, for guiding us through this week's lesson. And I want to thank you for joining us again this week as we take this incredible journey through the great controversy, discerning truth and error and choosing to follow Jesus all the way. We look forward to having you join us again next week as we continue our study here on Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Writ.